Welcome everyone again to another episode of the IDME show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future, future creators, and for all those that love great stories. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your life sciences ambassador along for the journey. Uh, so the United States Center for Disease Control uh, currently refers to as chronic degenerative disease as the public health challenge of the 21st century, especially due to the fact that 75, 80% of our healthcare spending is on people with chronic degenerative conditions, which are this nation's leading cause of death and disability. Uh, preventative healthcare uh, consists of all those measures that are ultimately taken for the chronic prevention of disease. Uh, and as the disease and disability uh, are affected by so many different factors, environment, genetic predisposition, disease causing agents, lifestyle choices, and what have you, uh, and our dynamic processes that may occur in humans years before they're ever affected, if we could intervene earlier, uh, we could have a significant impact, uh, not only on the deaths that could have been prevented, but on the lifelong disability, the compromised quality of life, and of course, the incredible healthcare costs. Um, a couple episodes ago, we were joined by uh, Dr. Robert Hariri, uh, who along with um, Craig Venter and Peter Diamandis had co-founded uh, Human Longevity Inc. Uh, the company that was merging a variety of human genotype and phenotype data with machine learning to develop new ways to fight and prevent disease. Uh, today, we are honored to be joined by none other than Human Longevity Inc.'s executive chairman, uh, Dr. Wei Wu He, uh, who has been serving as executive chairman of the company since July of 2019. Uh, Dr. He received his PhD in molecular biology from Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, he received his MBA from here at the Wharton School in Philadelphia. Uh, prior to human longevity, uh, Dr. He was uh, the CEO of a company called Origin Technologies, which was focused on creating different tools uh, for the collection of full-length human complementary DNA, which, use, uh, which are used by the pharmaceutical, biotech, and academic research communities. And he remains chairman of the board of that company. Uh, Dr. He's also the founder and general partner of Emerging Technology Partners, which is a life science-focused venture capital fund uh, established back in 2000. Uh, Dr. He's been involved in founding or funding over 60 biotech companies throughout his career, so may, several of which have gone on to be acquired by significantly larger firms. Uh, in early part of his career, Dr. He was one of the first scientists ever at the Human Genome Sciences Company, uh, and prior to that was a research fellow at the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Dr. He is uh, author to more than 30 different research publications and been on 32 different patents. Uh, it's going to be a really exciting show today. Uh, Dr. He, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us. Oh, thank you, Ara. It's, uh, it's, it's an honor, as, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I mentioned before we got on the call, it's good to see you again. Uh, yes, <laughs> after all, after 20 some years, uh, yeah. we first met uh, in Maryland 20 years ago. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. You look the yeah. same, by the way. So you must, oh, great. You must be doing Thank you. Great. Thank you. That my longevity science is working. <laughs> I think so. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I would love, love for you to, um, you know, we give, the, we give the floor to our guests at the beginning to talk for a little while about themselves. If you can uh, take some time to go uh, into sort of the early days of Dr. Wei Wu He, uh, a little bit of your background, where you grew up, uh, how you got interested in science, in molecular biology, and as a lot of your, you know, I went to a lot of your papers and a lot of those are focused on cancer biology. If you can also talk a little about your interest in oncology, that'd be great. Yeah, that would be great. Well, you know, Ira, you know, although we know each other for 20 years, you probably don't know that my hidden story, why I got involved in cancer biology and all that. So I grow up in China, you know, so, uh, you know, I'm 55 years old and uh, you can figure that, uh, you know, but my, uh, I grew up with my grandmother, you know, because my mother is a professor in the, you know, part of the, uh, you know, cultural revolution. My mother was sent to the countryside to be uh, re-educated. Uh, so I really grew up with my grandmother. And uh, around, you know, I'll say I was about seven years old. My grandmother was diagnosed with cervical cancer and, you know, was, uh, died within two months of diagnosis. You know, for a seven-year-old, uh, you know, seven years is a very interesting age. You know, you, you know enough to, uh, to kind of say, you know, being puzzled by, you know, why your grandmother, you know, in early 60s, you know, apparently extremely healthy, 
and can be diagnosed with a deadly disease and uh, drop dead, you know, in two months. So, you know, that kind of propelled my kind of curiosity and uh, interest. So when I, you know, went to college, although, you know, my biology was never my strong suit, uh, but I start, decided to uh, study biochemistry at Nanjing University and followed a professor, Dr. Zheng Ji. You know, he actually is the old, longest living professor on earth. Hmm. I think he lived to 110. Wow. And he was lecturing in, you know, uh, he's the first guy, you know, first professor in China wrote the first textbook of biochemistry in China. And he's also the founder of Nutritional Society in China, an aging society in China. And when he was, uh, you know, 85 years old, I was his, you know, uh, you know, a graduate student. And he always bragged to me that, you know, we actually using science and nutrition, you can live over 100. And he just, he, he's a prime example. He lived to 110. And he was actually lecturing, I think, when he was 108 years old. Uh, so, but, you know, he's a guy, you know, uh, really convinced me that if you want to pursue high quality science, you have to go to the U.S. Because he, he got his Ph.D. in the 1930s uh, before World War II uh, in, in, in the U.S. and returned to China. And, uh, you know, so, so I came to the U.S. Uh, to do my Ph.D. at uh, Baylor uh, in 86. And so my whole life is interested in cancer research. You know, the first gene I ever cloned is a gene called PSA. You know, I was not the first one cloned it, but that's the project. If you look at my first publication ever, it's a, a journal of urology publication. It's the cloning and study the gene expression of PSA. And uh, then I oft followed my mentor at Baylor to Mayo Clinic because uh, Mayo is, uh, you know, I was always interested in the research and clinical application mm -hmm. of research. And after my PhD and after my, you know, uh, you know, stay at Mayo, I went to Mass General. Again, I worked in the surgical department. <laughs> okay, so, so as a molecular biologist. Cool. So, you know, actually, uh, so I really got to know, you know, uh, somebody you know very well, Dr. Bill Hasselton, you know, yeah. and he at the time was starting out uh, a, 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 you know, a high throughput genomic sequencing company called Human Genome Sciences with Dr. Craig Venter. Yep. This is, uh, you know, a late 1992. And uh, so, so, you know, I was introduced to Dr. Bill Hasselton and, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was com trying to convince me to join the company. And at the time, I think the company has less than 20 people. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just funded by Healthcare Venture. So, you know, make the long story short, you know, early 1993, I left Harvard and joined uh, Human Genome Sciences literally as the first scientist uh, because I was convinced that, you know, genome science uh, is ultimately going to change very many aspects of, uh, long, you know, life sciences. So my involvement, you know, so ever since I joined HGS, you know, HGS was a very, you know, early on, very successful story of raising the capital, you know, cut the $125 million deal with Zen, the Smith Klein Beechen. You were there when, uh, you know, when we did the deal. Yep. And uh, so after about four years, I was actually convinced, you know, the best way to commercialize life sciences innovation is through new fo company formation. So you can actually start a new company and you can, whether you want to bet on a, a new diagnostic technology or you want to bet on a new uh, drug target or a new, any innovation, mm -hmm. it's better to form a new corporation and you get the right people involved, raise enough money and focus on that, you know, service or product and just go for it. So ever since 93, my experience with human genome sciences, I have been, you know, turned myself into kind of a company builder and investor. So then I started my own company, Origin, and, you know, then I realized I'm so incapable of communicating with all the Wall Street investor, and uh, that's why I went, why I was running my company, I went to uh, Wharton, did two years of uh, 
uh, financing uh, training. Mm -hmm. And 2000, we started our first venture fund, Emerging Technology Partners. That's actually the fund we invested in human longevity, uh, you know, uh, with uh, a lot of investors. So my relationship with human longevity is after I built, you know, my own company and invested in 60 some biotech companies, I went to revisit uh, Dr. Craig Venter in, uh, I think, early 2015. And uh, he was, you know, just raised a series B for human longevity with Bob and Peter. And, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm really, you know, have a high affinity for the word longevity, right? So, and I, you know, so we actually end up uh, investing in the series B okay. and join the board. And so now we keep investing in this company because we truly believe in it. Sure. Because uh, uh, so now, you know, I'm the chairman and, uh, of the company and uh, doing a little bit of the management of this company, working with Craig. Uh, because I think, you know, Craig's vision, it really, you know, is at the core of this company mm -hmm. is we now can collect over 100 gigabytes of data from you. Uh, you know, when my grandmother was diagnosed with cervical cancer. This is, you know, before the Nobel Prize was awarded to HPV, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, she didn't know better. Uh, you know, at the time in the early 70s, uh, in China, we don't have HPV testing, let alone HPV vaccine. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, she actually got a late stage cervical cancer. So I think for a lot of disease prevention, you, you know, it's really about how do we develop a better way to detect the risk factor, and then generate appropriate intervention. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, by combining genomic data with imaging data, microbiome, uh, you know, traditional lab, lab uh, you know, data, how do we create a more better intelligence mm -hmm. for our health? And you actually really say that, you know, chronic, age-related chronic diseases are going to be the biggest, uh, you know, problem for the aging society, not just for United States, it's for China, Japan, Italy, it, we all face the same issue. Right. Because we human society has never ever seen, you know, over 100 million people over the age of 65, right? So that, you know, how do we delay the age related uh, chronic diseases? It's really at the core of our technology and uh, service development at human longevity. Excellent. Excellent. I appreciate yeah. that intro. And yeah, we have, uh, we, we always talk about those demographics that are not just yeah. where we are now, but what's happening or being you know, predicted to, to happen by 2050. I think the number is like two and a half billion over yeah, the age of exactly. 65. So we have, you know, we, we, we have a lot of work to do. And, yes. um, so, you know, focusing on, on Human Longevity Inc., um, you know, you, you came out with this fascinating paper a couple of months ago. It was in the, uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, yeah. uh, Precision Medicine, Integrating Whole Genome Sequencing, Comprehensive Metabolomics, and Advanced Imaging. Uh, over a thousand individuals, uh, you looked at uh, genomes, imaging, blood metabolites, on and on. Uh, and you, now you have this portfolio, this, uh, really this set of information on, on how this all fits together. Talk a little bit about it, uh, health this, health nucleus, and sort of what you're saying. I mean, I've, I've listened to a lot of your presentations in the past about uh, different cases where, you know, yeah. somebody yeah. That has a ridiculous high cholesterol, you, you find right. a new gene that no one's known yeah. about. But talk a few about those cases. I think they're really fascinating and it sort of give great examples of how this all potentially will look as it, as it, as it further unfolds. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, I think HG, you know, human longevity is really, you know, I think it's one of the few company really pioneering the integration of whole genome sequencing data mm -hmm. and imaging data and all that. I think the PNS paper is a, it's really the first step. You know, I, you know, it's a really, you know, it's a, it's, it's a humble beginning of, you know, humans, you know, attempt to, use as much uh, data, including the genomic data, to predict, you know, your risk factor for diseases, right? So, you know, we ultimately, you know, I, I don't know of any human being, uh, don't die of something, okay? So the question is, can we, for certain diseases, it's totally preventable, like cervical cancer, 
you know, the, obviously cervical cancer, the biggest risk is HPV infection. Yep. But different people carry different risks. Some risk indeed comes from our genome. You know, the most famous case, obviously, is, uh, you know, Angelina Jolie is very open about her familial, you know, inheritance for the BRCA1 gene, which is a high-risk gene for breast cancer. But we now know that there's a lot of cancer runs in families, like the P53 mutation, uh, you know, and the, uh, you know, many genes, you know, the, uh, there's you know, a few hundred genes which will increase your odds of uh, getting cancer. But it doesn't mean you will 100% get cancer, but it's a risk factor. Sure. You know, there's always a group of people says, I don't really want to know, okay? <laughs> but, you know, for me, you know, I love to know. You know, if I have a, you know, genetic risk factor for glioma, I like to know. Uh, if I have a genetic risk factor for colon cancer, I like to know. Because glioma, we don't quite have all the solution for glioma yet. For colon cancer, the solution is actually pretty mature. Today, you can use cologuard, colonoscopy, and you know to really you know catch the tumor at a very early stage. Right. And a, a, a simple surgical uh, you know uh, recession you know will prevent you from a late stage colon cancer. Mm -hmm. So if you really look at human longevity, is we are trying to put all that data together to help people live longer and healthy. So I always say, you know, if somebody is willing to come back to our house, cl house nucleus clinic mm -hmm. every year, there's certain cancers we can 100% make sure that you won't die of, mm -hmm. like colon cancer. You know, I think colon cancer is a pretty good example. It's a pretty slow growing tumor, and you can catch it pretty early with a combination of, uh, you know, a, a cologuard and a colonoscopy. Uh, prostate cancer, you know, actually we think prostate cancer will sooner or later become a totally preventable cancer. Mm. We actually, you know, uh, you know, my partner, David Carroll, Dr. David Carroll, he pioneered the using 3T MRI uh, and using a technology called RSI MRI. It's a, you know, it's basically you can tweak the, tweak the, the uh, you know, MRI machine to look for fast growing tumor cells because the fast growing tumor cell has restriction of mood, water movement in the nucleus. Okay. And he can actually stage your prostate cancer more accurately with MRI than a needle biopsy. Hmm. Right? So you don't need to do needle biopsy, uh, biopsy anymore. So I think combining with genomics and imaging, you know, we think we can detect very early on prostate cancer. We don't have all the solution yet. For instance, we are really working on the solution for pancreatic cancer mm -hmm. because, you know, apparently when you are doing the MRI, the pancreas moves a lot. Mm -hmm. So you, it's really very difficult to focus on the pancreas. Uh, so now, you know, even their, their scientists has created a solution to stabilize using AI machine learning to kind of synchronize the movement of your MRI with your pancreas. Hmm. So you can actually see two very early uh, lesions of pancre pancreatic tumor. So I think these are all the, you know, the new technology that we are putting together inside human longevity and inside you know, our clinic, you know, uh, house nucleus. Mm -hmm. So if, to understand how, what do we do with ha house nucleus is, you know, we are a clinic treats disease risks. We don't treat end stage diseases. Okay. You know, I, I personally think, you know, Mayo Clinic, Mass General is so much better if you have a liver, you have a colon cancer already metastasized to your liver. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, our clinic, you know, is hoping that you will never get a late stage colon cancer to start with because we caught it five years ahead of time, right? But the technology is still slowly getting there. You know, it will take a long time for us to truly make this a common practice. But the essence of that is the cost of detecting these disease risk signal is coming down significantly. Mm -hmm. So we ultimately believe that the medicine we are practicing is going to be actually pretty cheap. Uh, if you really look at a whole genome sequencing, 
you know, when Solera and the U.S. government decode the first human genome, yep. it costed over a few billion dollars, right? So, but today we can decode a genome for less than a thousand dollars, right? So I'm sure that in another 10 years, we can probably do a whole genome for less than a hundred dollars. Mm. Uh, so, you know, right now we do a few genetic diseases and charging, you know, the mother a few hundred dollars for like PKU. Right. But in the future, for a hundred dollars, we will detect all 20,000 genetic diseases. And some of them are rare genetic diseases for, you know, a hundred, two hundred dollars. So I think the genome the testing and genome interpretation will become part of human rights for when you're born. Uh, so that's, that's what really technology is coming together. I really think that uh, this is, a, you know, we're living in a very exciting era to have all these data and predict your risk factors. This is why I believe that, uh, you know, we, you know, a, a significant number of our clients will live over the age of 100. Yeah. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. I like to hear that. <laughs> yeah. So, well, join us. So, we, you know, we, we just created a punchline called a B100 plus. <laughs> so, so, B100 plus, because, uh, you know, if you actually really look at the, uh, you know, the president of the United States, uh, they probably get a very good, you know, managed care from a group of physicians. If you get an elected president of the United States, one of the fringe benefit is you will have a government uh, paid, you know, house care plan, mm -hmm. you know, called presidential plan for the rest of your life. So you probably get a bodyguard for the rest of your life and you get a, a medical care uh, system for the rest of your, the presidential care for the rest of your life. But the three essence, three pillars of the presidential care is, you know, president probably every year has to do an annual physical. It's a very deep dive into your data. Yep. Uh, secondly, you have a physician with you for all the time. If you are, you know, if I'm sure the president flying uh, Air Force One, there's a physician inside Air Force One. Sure. Right? And then if you have ever discovered there's certain diseases in early stage, you know, whether it's a cardiovascular disease or a small tumor, Mm -hmm. uh, you probably, you know, your presidential team will call up a Cleveland Clinic or Mass General or MD Anderson and find the best physician to take care of that, you know, minor uh, disease very early on. Mm -hmm. So this is the three pillar is collecting data, uh, constant care by, you know, smart physicians, right. and then get rid of diseases at very early stage, right? So those three pillars, if you practice those three pillars, the average life expectancy of today's United States president is about 94, I think. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, you know, and so, it, which is about 10 years longer, the average U.S., sure. you know, 13 years longer. 13, yeah. But the question is, how do we use modern technology, using data, to democratize this uh, presidential care to everybody on earth, yep. right? That is so my, even my grandmother can, can have access to uh, this, uh, this quality of presidential care in the future. Mm -hmm. That really is the mission of human longevity. Awesome, really great yeah. stuff. Um, one, one, one aspect of, um, once again, sort of this comprehensive view um, that has become very hot in recent years, especially now with uh, with the situation we're in, is is the topic of the microbiome. Um, yeah, which as you know also encompasses this thing called the virome, which are all the the viruses yeah. that live yeah, yeah. symbiotically amongst us and so forth. Um, Human Life uh, Longevity uh, Inc. Uh, published a paper a couple of years ago on the blood uh, virome. Um, in 8,000 patients, which was a fascinating study in its own right and a little over my head, but nonetheless, it, you know, once again, it talked about the, the importance of technology uh, in being able to say, you know, you know what's a, a nice virus, what's a contaminant, uh, so talk a little bit, if you would, about the, the importance of, of the microbiome in this whole equation and how you use data and, and some of this machine learning to, to deal with it, because we're learning so much about how it is 
A hundred trillion cells strong, or hundred yeah. trillion organisms strong, and um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, well, you know, I actually, you know, I'm probably it's a little bit over my head as well, and uh, okay, well, let's talk you, that way. Then. You know, <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, I think microbiome. You know, I'm actually, you know, Craig, Dr. Venter just recently invited me to uh, on the board of trustee of his institute, the Venter Institute. Okay. So, you know, here at the Venter Institute, you know, I think they, they have pioneered, you know, they are, you know, the, the Craig's Institute is the first one decode the first microbiome genome. Right. And it's also the first company to make a synthetic, uh, you know, uh, genome, uh, a synthetic bio, you know, microbiome. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Karen, the president of the Institute is, uh, you know, is a really at the, a pioneer at the, the microbiome research. Mm -hmm. I have to say, you know, microbiome clearly is very, very important. The, the most solid data is obviously for C. diff infection, right? So nosocomial infection. So if you have the wrong microbiome, you are much easily infected by uh, C. diff, you know, it's a microbiome. But with that, you know, I think we human beings understand so little about the impact of microbiome viral, you know, viral, you know, genome in our system. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think, you know, this is why I'm so, you know, I'm so much looking forward to the next 10, 20 years. There will be so much uh, data to, to help us understand this. So even for the human genome, you know, people talk as if, you know, Today, you know, decoding your genome only costs a thousand dollars. That doesn't mean anything. I always, you know, uh, it's a, it's like I give you a Bible, but it's written in Hebrew. Uh, uh, yes, the Bible is only a thousand dollars, but if you don't read Hebrew, it still doesn't mean anything to you. You know, having the Bible or ha have no Bible, if you don't understand the language is is in the Bible, it, the Bible doesn't help you. Right, so our genome, yeah, I can decode your genome for a thousand dollars, you know, Ira. Yeah. But if I just give you lots, three billion codes, GATC, 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 it doesn't mean anything, right. right? So what we really care about is, you know, what are the genes associated with, you know, breast cancer risk, like BRCA1? Mm -hmm. What are the genes associated with Parkinson diseases, like the LRRK2? But, you know, but that a lot of that risk factor is not a monogenic gene. It's a group of genes. You know, they, you know, it's a polygenic risk score. You know, some people don't believe in polygenic score. I'm a big believer in that. You know, how tall you are, you know, how, whether somebody is prone to, you know, even I think for COVID-19 infection, there's a probably a genetic factor. There's a recent paper on HLA typing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have the right HLI typing, you know, you can survive better with COVID-19 infection. If you have the wrong HLI typing, you know, your chance of being affected by the virus is much more significant. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's all, you know, that, that knowledge is being accumulated as we move forward with, uh, you know, better technology and all that. Sure. So, I, you know, I think we only understand 3 to 5% of our genome. Uh, you know, you know, the decode of genome, you know, in terms of our health and longevity and delaying age related chronic illness. Yep. Right. So, and, and, you know, so, you know, so it's basically you have a Bible, it's in Hebrew, but you can understand 3% of it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, so, you know, that 3%, you know, can already help people like Angelina Julie and a lot of other people, right? So for a lot of genetic diseases, like, you know, beta thalassemia, PKU, uh, you know, having that knowledge is very, very critical, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, as we go on to understand more and more of our genome, what does that mean? You know, that, you know, I think the impact for human health is going to be profound. Mm -hmm. And microbiome, you know, I think microbiome is even at the, a more nascent stage than the human genome, let's put it this way, because I think microbiome, we have more microbiome cells in our system than our own cell, right? <laughs> so, uh, and the complexity, because it's millions of species can actually, uh, you know, uh, in, be residing in your system.
Uh, And that changes all the time. So, you know, because, you know, a lot of us, you know, never has been exposed to COVID-19. Now there's probably, I don't know how many people, there's data showing that, you know, significant percentage of human being has been exposed to COVID-19. Sure. It probably changes your viral, uh, you know, and, and microbiome environment in your system. What is the consequence of that? We don't know. We don't know. But, I, you know, I think the beauty of today is, you know, the age that, uh, you know, if you compare to the 1918 uh, Spanish uh, pan, uh, flu pandemic versus today, right. today we understand the biology of a viral infection so much better than you know, about a hundred years ago. Yep. And we can create vaccines, you know, we can, we can have PCRs, we, we can have antibody tests in all within a few months, right? So, but, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always very hopeful that uh, we human beings will develop even better technology. So in the future, you know, another 20, 30 years later, another pandemic shows up, we really know how to deal with it. Right. And it really takes action. Yep. It takes you know, the government, individual companies, nonprofit to really, really, you know, take this seriously. How do we control disease risks? How do we understand disease risks, right? And that, you know, uh, that, that is fundamentally important for our human health. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Um, looking at, at staying on the... <laughs> the human longevity theme for a moment, but then uh, I'm going to ask you to put on your venture capital hat as well, because, um, you know, 20 years ago when we first met, um, if we looked at the, the top 10 uh, selling drug list at the time, you know, it was Lipitor and Viagra and Celebrex and whatever was yeah. on it now. Today, when we look at that list, I open it up and I see 10 monoclonal antibodies staring back yeah. at me. Yeah. Um, most I don't know what they did, <laughs> but yeah. um, with, with, with that in mind and thinking, okay, we, you, you're, you, you're unloading a tremendous amount of this data, crunching it, great insights, maybe some surgery here, so forth and so on. Where do you think we're going if, if we go out a little bit now, the next 10, 15 years? Obviously, you see a lot of companies and, and like nothing confidential, of course. Are we looking at more monoclonals? Are we out of the era of small molecules, do you think? Are there other types of pharmacotherapy interventions that are gonna be uh, required to intervene once we have, you know, have this, uh, have the health nucleus data in front of us? Where do, where do you see a lot of this going? I'd love to well, you know, I mean, I think life sciences is, you know, driven by humans' intrinsic uh, need to live longer and healthier, right? So. And it, it, in general, there's two, I, you know, as a venture capitalist in this space, you know, there's two major technology frontier is driving the innovation. Is a, you know, the one class is what I call better way to detect something, mm-hmm. right? So if you look at today's MRI machine, the PSA testing, the genome testing, the NIPT, the prenatal diagnostic testing, these are all better technology to detect something. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's 11 Nobel Prize, you know, behind the new MRI machine. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, today we can use a big machine to look at, you know, tiny tumors in your body and look at your dan- bone density in your body. It's because, you know, there's a lot of scientists, you know, worked on for years and years and years. And then you have company like Siemens and G to put these technology together into a big, you know, B, you know, MRI machine to better see something, right? And the other aspect is what I call the, a better tool to perturbation, for perturbation. You know, monoclonal antibodies, small molecule, you know, exercise, better diet is all intervention, what I call perturbation. Sure. So it's really the two, you know, the two, uh, you know, major trends uh, you know, a better way to see it, I think genomic technology, you know, the, what Illumina developed on next-gen sequencing, PCR, and all that, is a better way to see something. But if you can better see something, then you can develop tools to better intervene, right? Mm-hmm. So if you look at lung cancer, I mean, lung cancer, you have, you know, drugs 
against you know, a specific mutation like ALK mutation. You have a specific mutation against NRTK, you know, Loxo oncology drug. Uh, so the only reason they can develop these drugs is because now we can sequence uh, a tumor uh, you know, and find out what is the driver gene for those tumors. And then you can design specific intervention to block that driver gene, right? So, but, so I personally don't really care what is the modality of intervention. You know, as a patient, you know, if you have two months to live, do you really care if a physician give you a small molecule surgery, a, a monoclonal antibody or sRNA or a cell therapy? Nope. If whatever the modality the, the doctor delivered to you will let you live extra 10 years, you're going to take it. Okay, so, so, right. So, you know, so, but that's, you know, end stage diseases. Yep. But, you know, if you're 50 years old, if I tell you that actually, you know, era, if you want to live extra 10 years, you just need to exercise one hour a day. Okay, so, uh, well, but that actually probably is a harder sell <laughs> so, uh, than, uh, than, uh, but you know what we are doing at Human Longevity is we're using data to show people that you know if you don't exercise, you know you won't have enough muscle, yep. uh, you know you, you know to live over a hundred. Because if you look at you know uh, you know President Jimmy Carter, I'm a big fan of Dr., uh, you know President Jimmy Carter, and you know wonderful guy. Uh, he got the you know he he got the melanoma. And in 2016, you know, he, his tumor actually already metastasized to the brain. But thanks to Merck's Kachuda, uh, you know, he's cured. But apparently last year, you know, his biggest risk factor is he fall a few times. Mm. Uh, because he's 95 years old, right? 94, 95 years old. So, if, you know, at 94, 95 years old, you know, you're physical strength to hold the balance become a very, very important uh, factor to live, live long and healthy. Sure. Now, if you actually you know, know that when you're 60 years old, you can actually purposely build some bone density and muscle strength, preparing yourself to live over 100, right? But, uh, but we human beings usually you know, don't deal with the, don't like to deal with the issue when it's, when it doesn't show up, <laughs> it's all so, right. So, you know, so, so, but the question is how do we use the modern technology huh? to show people that, you know, uh, you, know, you, you know, you actually have the risk for developing osteoporosis mm -hmm. when you are 90 years old, okay? But now you're 60 years old, get enough sunshine, get enough vitamin D, do enough exercise, so you can delay your osteoporosis by five years, you know, so you can live healthily from 90 to 95 without a bone fracture, right? Mm -hmm. But that is a hard sell. Sure. But the technology, believe it or not, the better way to detect an intervention, I would say, you know, a lot of that is already there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So part of that is we need to educate the the you know the uh, the the the, the uh, you know the general people the lay people that you know eating a lot of you know processed food with a huge amount of sugar uh, is you know it, it will increase your liver fat and increase your 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 visceral fat and it will increase your odds of metabolic diseases and diabetes and obesity and that will even create you know a lot of the you know vascular dementia yep. is created by metabolic diseases, which is totally, totally, you know, uh, correctable by lifestyle changes, right? So, so one of the, you know, book my, uh, you know, 110 year old professor uh, wrote is, you know, it's a 10, you know, he uses lifestyle as a way to live to 110. Uh, so, you know, he has a 10 religion, he's, you know, 10 commandment to live over 100. Mm -hmm. One of them is, you know, eat well, exercise every day, and sleep well every night. <laughs> okay, so uh, sleeping, you know, we spend a third of our life uh, sleeping. But how many people know their sleep quality? Right. We just, we actually just invested in a company called Sleep Score. Okay. Uh, it's a machine you can buy from Amazon. You put it next to your bed. Actually, you can get a score 
uh, for your quality of your sleep every night, right? Uh, because we spend a third of our life sleeping, but you never know your quality of sleeping. <laughs> so, uh, but if you know your quality is not good, there's all kinds of ways to uh, you know, intervene to, 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 to improve the quality of your sleep, right? Even the food you take you know, affects your sleep. Even the alcohol you take, you know, how much alcohol you take affects your sleep. Yep. How much coffee you drink affects your sleep. Different people are different. You know, I'm a, a medium metabolizer for caffeine. So if I drink ca coffee after 12 noon, uh, you know, it will affect my sleep. Mm. But if I drink it before uh, 12 noon, I'm okay. So if I want to have a good night of sleep, I shouldn't drink anything with ca caffeine after 12, noon time. So, so I actually did it. You know, I monitored, you know, I drink a cup of coffee at 2 p.m., my sleep score will go down. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so these are the, you know, so the two technology, in, you know, frontier we're pushing. It's a better way to detect something like PSA, prostate cancer, detecting HPV, uh, Simprep, uh, pap smear to prevent, you know, cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. The other is intervention. And I, you know, I think I'm a big fan of monoclonal antibody because monoclonal antibody is kind of a natural molecule in our yeah. system. Uh, you already see it, there's monoclonal antibody can neutralize COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, and I'm a big fan of cell therapy because I think one of the most powerful tool to change your body's uh, cell composition is you engineering T cell or NK cell, right? So you can train these cells to go after a particular, uh, you know, bad cell. You know, one, of, one part of our aging process is as we get older, we have a lot of so-called zombie cell in our system. Sure. These cells don't do anything. It's like any bureaucracy. You know, you, you have a lot of uh, middle management, they don't do anything, but they, they take salary, they take pensions, but they actually always can say no. <laughs> okay. so, uh, so nothing ever gets done because you have a gigantic bureaucracy. So as we age, you know, we accumulate so many of these so-called zombie cells yeah. uh, and they secrete cytokines, create inflammation. How do we get rid of it? You know, so how do we use, you know, uh, in our immune system to get rid of it? Yep. Right. So, and that is, you know, so I think, you know, I'm very open to uh, therapeutic modalities. Mm -hmm. I still think a small molecule will, will stay because it's the easiest uh, modality to administer. You know, you take a pill a day, you know, that's, you're done. People, patients love that, right? But, you know, if a monoclonal antibody infusion, you know, once a month or once every two months, you know, you can get rid of tumor. Why not? Okay. A cell therapy, you know, you do once in your lifetime, you, you get rid of all your CD19 positive uh, BALL tumor cell and save your life. Why not? Right. So surgery, why not? Right. So, but we are improving all these modalities. You know, so I was talking to one of the leading cardiologists in the world. A lot of the open heart surgery now today can be replaced with, you know, uh, minimum uh, invasive surgery. So you don't need to open heart anymore because open heart is a, it's a, it's a, it creates its own risk, right? So, and so, so I, think, I think the next 20 years, we, you know, we human beings, it's the, it's the golden age of life sciences uh, innovation. And I think, you know, human longevity, you know, we're committed to how do we put these technology quickly to help our client, you know, uh, live long and healthy. And that's really the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, kind of the mission of our company. Because medical innovation takes a long time really? to, uh, to, uh, to, you know, be accepted. You know, I always use the story of Dr. Samuel Weiss. Uh, Dr. Samuel Weiss is, uh, is uh, you know, a Hungarian uh, physician. Yep. He observed that, you know, he had to use control data. He had one group of gynecologists wash their hand. Another group of gynecologists don't wash their hand. Mm -hmm. He observed, you know, close to 20% reduction in death rate uh, during baby delivery for the mother, right? So, but he published that. How long did it take we human beings accept his theory of, 
you know, of washing hand to reduce death rate at birth, about 50 years. <laughs> so, so, you know, so, you know, and he had a data to show people, you know, hey, you know, if you wash hand, the death rate drops, you know, double digit. Uh, he has data, but nobody wants to listen to that. So I think we human beings are getting a little bit smarter. The, I think I was just talking to, you know, Dr. Kasky, the senior author on our PNS paper. Yep. In the United States, any medical innovation still takes on, I think, average about 11 years to become mainstream practice. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, so for instance, we truly believe that, you know, PSA, like, you know, for prostate cancer detection is very inaccurate. Uh, you should use a combination of genetics plus uh, MRI uh, to do uh, detection. But, you know, that practice probably has been accepted by leading urologists, you know, in the last three to five years. But, you know, I'm still talking to urologists uh, you know, in private practice, they haven't heard about it. <laughs> so, 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 so that is, you know, that is the challenge that uh, we are facing, right? We are, you know, we're pushing the technology innovation, but sometimes, you know, it's the frustration that, you know, some of the technology don't get accepted as fast as they should be. Sure. But that's part of the, you know, evolution. You know, I'm, I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. Because this is really, you know, uh, you know, my passion to push the envelope of, you know, technology innovation and how do we bring this to, to, to the to the people as fast as humanly can. Mm -hmm. right. Wonderful. Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely are extremely passionate about it. And hopefully, I'll be doing this for the rest. Of my oh, you can uh, come visit us in San Diego. You know, we actually reopened our house nucleus. Uh, by the way, we are actually opening up a new site uh, in Bay Area uh, because uh, we have a lot of uh, Bay Area clients. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so eventually we're going to open 10 house nuclear sites in probably you know, 10 major cities uh, along, around the globe because we call it a house nucleus. It's, a, it's really like a cell nucleus right. uh, because cell nucleus contains all the information to dictate you know, you know, the, the development of a, you know, fertilized egg, all the information is already in the nucleus. Yeah. And we think by having a physical building in major cities, that if people really want to understand their data, their data to alleviate the risk of their age-related chronic illnesses, mm -hmm. they can just walk into our clinic. You know, we will have physician there. We will have, uh, we will have, you know, we'll collect, initially we'll collect 150 gigabytes of data from you and do all the analysis and to say, you know, Ira, you know, your next five years, your biggest risk is this. And, you know, but we can also help you to alleviate your risk factor. You know, a year ago, you know, I might, you know, as a venture capitalist, I enjoy eating and uh, I like to eat yeah. and, uh, so my liver fat was high, my visceral fat was high. You know, ever since I become the chairman, I said, if I don't take action, you know, that's not good. Uh, so, so I actually went on a, you know, a diet and also did intermittent fasting. I lost uh, 22 pounds. <laughs> so, so, uh, and my liver fat is, you know, is like 2.3%, which is, I think, 4% is considered to be, you know, uh, high liver fat. My, I lost 1.5 liters worth of visceral fat. So that is a major risk factor for metabolic diseases. So, so that, you know, I guess, you know, you can do something even if you're, you're apparently healthy. And that's really the essence of our first PNS paper. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first 1,100 patients, you know, we combined genomic data, microbiome data, uh, you know, the traditional lab core uh, data and uh, 3T whole body MI data. Well, we discovered, you know, these 1,000 people, they all think they are healthy. Mm -hmm. But about 14% of them, they actually need to take immediate medical, uh, you know, uh, attention. They need immediate medical attention, right? So people who has, you know, extremely high risk of heart attack, mm -hmm. uh, 
So, so we actually had one person, you know, we predicted he has an extremely high risk for heart attack. Between he left house nucleus to schedule a cardiologist visit, mm-hmm. he had a heart attack. And luckily he didn't die. You know, he, uh, he actually, he's actually okay. Right. But, you know, this just tells you that, you know, uh, the predicting your risk factor is so critical for managing your long-term health. That's the, that's the, you know, but, you know, I mean, we're at the very beginning of this movement. Uh, we think that by the time we human, you know, society has two billion, oh, you know, 65, 75 year citizen, mm-hmm. uh, taking proactive uh, preventative medicine is a must. Because we call today, you know, to, today the U.S. healthcare is not really healthcare. It's a, we spent disproportional amount of our money treating patients in the last six months or last one year of their life. Sure. We probably spent, I don't know, half a million to a million dollars to treat an end stage colon cancer patient. But shouldn't we spend a thousand dollars a year to make sure that client, that patient never get colon cancer to start with? Right? So we could have saved a million dollars, that very expensive, a small molecule drug or cell therapy or monochrome antibody drug. Mm-hmm. Right? So, the, the goal is not to, you know, extend people's life by three, five months because they already have a cancer metastasized to their liver or lung. The, the goal has to be they should, these, uh, you know, people should never get a late stage cancer to start with, right? I think, you know, I personally believe that the technology is getting there, you know, with liquid biopsy, you know, what garden house, you know, and uh, exact science is developing. Oh, I think, you know, and plus imaging technology, there's no doubt in my mind, next 20 years, I would say 80% of cancer mm-hmm. should be preventable. Now, there's a few cancer, we're still working on it, glioma, pancreatic cancer, these tumors grow so fast. Right. Uh, and it's also very difficult to intervene because the location, the physical location of the tumor. Sure. Uh, but, you know, for colon cancer, liver cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, I think these cancers should all be preventable in the next 10, 20 years. And that, that's why, so my grandmother should, with the modern technology, my grandmother should live extra 20 years, right? Or maybe even 30. Because uh, that's, you know, that's really the, you know, the science, you know, we're passionate about uh, bringing to the marketplace. What, what, one last, one, one final yeah. question. And just uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, you uh, did a, a deal uh, at Human Longevity uh, on, with a company called Solius. Um, yeah. that's involved in uh, harnessing the, the light waves of the sun without the, you know, the damaging ones, sort of uh, yeah. natural ways to get different wavelengths and vitamin D and so forth. It is very interesting because obviously one can see how health nucleus is plus various other wellness and health technologies could you know, integrate all this stuff together. It, it talk us a little bit about that sort of because it's a little different than sort of the traditional theme, but nonetheless, you, you, you see it. But the other thing that's, that really struck me as interesting as well, uh, in the press release, it mentions the investment was made via Human Longevity Inc.'s corporate venture fund. Yes. Are, are yes. you creating a, a hybrid, I mean, I, obviously nothing confidential here, but it, are you morphing HLI into something beyond a biotech company uh, creating a... Well, actually, you know, the, you, know, you know, I mean, I've been doing these venture investing for 20 years and yeah. building company for 20 years. So it's a, you know, so ever since I become the chairman, executive chairman, uh, you know, we're, we really, we really looked at the business model of human longevity, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, human longevity has already, you know, spent $500 million, you know, thanks to investment from Salgin, G, the world. Right. Uh, you know, but I think the reality is we, we concluded we cannot invent all the technology for longevity and performance. Sure. 
this is why we divested our even cancer sequencing company, uh, uh, you know, to Neo Genomics. That's public. Uh, you know, we sold that business to Neo. And Neo is a wonderful company. You know, they have a wonderful, well managed company. We think our cancer sequencing, you know, business in Neo's hand is so much more productive in than in our hand. So what we actually concluded is that, you know, we are actually better, better, better off focusing on one thing and one thing on it, mm -hmm. which is today the house nucleus. Okay. Is how do we, how do we build a house nucleus and combine all the technology we can get our hands on to build a delivery system to the client. So we actually, you know, on the house nucleus side, you know, we have a physical location. You come in, you know, Ara, I really like to, you know, bring you in to San Diego. So for a day, it's like an executive house, except, right. that, you know, we do probably 10, 100 times more than the traditional executive house. We do whole genome sequencing. We do whole body MRI. We do the, all the traditional uh, blood work on you, microbiome. And based on your risk factor, we may even implement some other testing, like a sleeping testing and all that, right? So that's the house nuclear. The first part is the, the annual physical, collecting data from you. The second part is we are actually hiring a group of really, really uh, kind of uh, prevention-focused doctors. Uh, these physicians, you know, they don't like to treat end-stage diseases. They like to help you to avoid those end stage diseases. So we have brought in functional medicine doctor. We have brought in doctors who is focused on managing your stress. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, you know, in San Diego, we're gonna have about 10 physicians like that. If you're one of our clients, you will be assigned a physician. So physician is your coach. And the physician is gonna use 150 gigabytes of data to, to help you. But then we will realize that our physician is limited because we are not Mayo Clinic. We are not Mass General Hospital. So this is why on the third leg, we created a platform called doctorsforme.ai. We use AI machine learning to match your risk with the best specialist in the world. Hmm. We actually already uh, you know, made an agreement with Mass General Hospital, okay. uh, at least for our, uh, you know, some of the overseas clients. So they can come to the zone, you know, a portal, and we can immediately, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, help our client to have access to a specialist at Mass General Hospital. Uh, so that's the three pillar we're building in, inside House Nucleus. So House Nucleus is not just a uh, executive house; it's an executive house plus a longevity and performance concierge doctor plus an AI machine learning program to link you with the best specialist if we cannot solve the problem, right? So, so that's House Nuclear. That's going to be our focus. But then how do we bring all the technology together? So we decided to form a corporate venture fund. Okay. And so believe it or not, we've already done four deals. And Solius is one of them. You know, we like the CEO. We like the technology. And, you know, a few of my loved ones, you know, my, my family has vitamin D deficiency, you know. So, and I was trying to do everything to get their vitamin D back, you know, by, you know, taking vitamin D. But not everybody likes to take pills because vitamin D is a hormone. Right. And, you know, some of my, you know, friends, you know, they, they, they always forget to take the vitamin D pill. But it turned out to be the most organic way of rebalancing your vitamin D is through sunshine. Right? So, so sunshine is, is the greatest, uh, you know, greatest, uh, you know, uh, organic therapy yep. for, for increasing your vitamin D and prevent osteoporosis, uh, you know, in the future. But actually, there's a lot of studies showing that people have vitamin D deficient. They are actually worse off when they get COVID-19 infection. Because vitamin D actually is a hormone critical for your immune system. Mm -hmm. So, but there are certain areas of the world, you know, like Sweden in the winter, uh, Canada in the winter, they don't get enough sunshine. Yep. So this company Solius, I think it's a wonderful company. Uh, Bob Wise, the CEO, 
is actually a, a client of human longevity, mm -hmm. and he's a believer in human longevity. So he and his team has created this machine. So this machine, you know, filters out all the bad UV light, UVA, right. which will cause skin cancers and all that, and kept all the good UV light, UVB, and made it into a machine. By the way, this machine is already approved by the Canadian FDA. Mm -hmm. So you can have access to like a gym, uh, you know. Actually, all you need to do is get, get three minutes and sit in this machine in, in, when you're doing exercise. It, it actually will bring your vitamin D level back to normal, you know, uh, for three minutes in two weeks. Okay? So, so, uh, so, so we think, you know, so, and I think they're working on a home machine. I think by, you know, the, what the really will change the, the vitamin D therapy is by the time their home machine is available. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, I love to get one, you know, for all my, you know, friends has vitamin D deficiency. So you can just put the one next to your shower. So before you go into the shower or maybe after the shower, you just stay in this machine for one minute and your, your vitamin D level will back to normal. So that you know, will prevent osteoporosis, prevent the decline of your immune system. And it's the most organic way of uh, doing it. And so that's, that's you know, why we get involved in, uh, a company like this, you know, we actually just made another investment I already mentioned with, uh, for Sleep Score, yeah. which is a machine you can put on next to your bed. So we are ultimately we want to bring house nucleus to your home. We call it house nucleus at home, mm. because historically, if you think about it, if you have sleeping issue like sleeping apnea and all that, you have to go to Stanford Sleeping Center. Yep. Or you go to Hopkins Sleeping Center. You have to sleep there. My problem is when I go to a sleeping center, I don't sleep well anyway. <laughs> okay, so it's a totally different environment. Now you can actually do all that study in your home, right? And get a real sleeping score and get, you know, there's another machine made by Razmat to detect your sleeping apnea at home. It's an FDA approved device. So so we, we will bring all that to your home through wearables, uh, digital technology. And so, you know, in the future, we will know so much about our condition uh, than ever before. And then hopefully, hopefully, we will have the most organic intervention. So instead of a monoclonal antibody or small molecule like Lipitor, uh, you know, we can create the most organic intervention through exercise, better diet, better sunshine, uh, you know, better social, you know, uh, social interaction. We can live a longer and healthy life, right? So how can we, the modern world, how do we create a society uh, to mimicking, you know, this book called Bruzum? They look at, you know, the Ikaria, the island of Ikaria in Greece and the Low Melinda in California. Yeah. People in those areas, there's significantly, significantly more people live the old age of 90. Yeah. And they are pretty healthy, right? And the one thing is, is for sure in that study is that the people living in the blue zone, they still die of the same age-related chronic diseases, mm -hmm. heart attack, cancer, and all that. But for whatever the reason, they delay the onset of the disease by 20 years. Right? So, so human longevity's mission is how do we use technology to help our client, hopefully everybody on Earth, to delay age-related chronic diseases by 20, 30 years. And so you still can be running marathon when you're 95 years old. And you can still write a book when you're 95 years old. You can still, you know, have, you know, a bridge game, you know, when you're 95 years old. I think that's, I think the technology is, is coming together. And we think, you know, the reason we created the fund is because we don't believe we, you know, we, we can invent all these technology. As a matter of fact, we need to work with anybody who is interested in, 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 in this uh, mission. You know, we have to work with Stanford, Harvard, MIT, all the startup company, some of the technology, we don't even know where, where they will come from. Okay, so, 
but we need to embrace that and be open-minded about it. And so, so, you know, I always think that a venture fund is a great way to, uh, to create communication and, uh, and uh, you know, collaboration. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, 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 uh, I really take my hat off to you when I think about that because it's just, you think about all the things that, you know, when you're working in one, you know, when I was wherever, it's with Klein, all the stuff that I was doing, but looking around at all the things that you weren't capable of doing because we didn't do those things, but you yes. in the seat of wearing, you know, your, the executive chairman hat, but you also have this amazing, you know, multi-dozen uh, company ability uh, through your VC experience to, to manage so much and see so much and, and think sort of in this integrated context. It's, it's really, really fascinating stuff. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think my hat with you. I wish you had one in Philly right now. I'd love to. <laughs> oh, we, you know, we, uh, somehow later we will. Yes, yeah, I'm sure yeah, you will. Somehow later we will. You know, so I think you know, East Coast. We we're already hiring a lot, a few locations: Boston, uh, New York area, DC, Philadelphia area, maybe you know, down you know, a little bit Florida. Uh, you know, because sooner or later we're going to bring these technologies to your home. Uh, and uh, you know that you know right now it's too difficult. The barrier to get Ira to San Diego is too hard. <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's the you know because I, there's significant number of executive uh, you know and you know some of my friends they every year they fly to Mayo Clinic to do executive house right. So and uh, you know it is a barrier you know. So I think in the future hopefully we will have these kind of clinic, you know, next door to, you know, CVS or, you know, Walgreens or, you know, Whole Foods even, right? So, and people can, you know, you know, you know, it's a birthright. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a birthright. Every year you collect, you know, 300 gigabytes of data on you and then using AI machine learning to computate your risk factor, right? So, so, you know, I always say, you know, 20 years ago when you buy a car, you don't have a sensor in your tie. So the only time you find out a flat tie is maybe on the highway. Oh, yeah. right? Today, you know, most car has, uh, you know, sensors in the tie. So if you start up your car in the morning, you know, it tells you one tie, you know, the PSI is down 20%. So you probably shouldn't take the car to the highway un until you inspected your tie. Yeah. Right? So I think in the future, uh, house will be like that. You know, how do we have sensors to predict, you know, our cardiovascular disease? How do we have sensor to predict, you know, uh, early stage cancers, right? How do, how do we have sensor to detect, uh, you know, early sign of dementia, right? So that's really the, you know, I think that is going to be a, you know, so the, the future clinic, you know, the clinic we are building is we treat disease risk. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we don't need to spend a million dollars, you know, when somebody has a colon cancer in their lung, right? So, and they can also live much longer and healthier. So that's, you know, that's hopefully uh, is the, you know, it, it will become a reality in our lifetime. But, you know, starting, starting prevention is not easy, okay? It, you know, starting somebody, you know, if somebody has lung cancer, it's already, you know, a big tumor on their lung, starting them a... $50,000 monochrome antibody is easy if you can extend, extend that person's life by six, seven months. That's easy because that person is in, you know, in, but if you told them that, hey, you have to do an annual physical to prevent lung cancer, that is a hard sell. That's true. That's human nature. <laughs> so, so we are really, you know, we're fully aware that, you know, the business model we are taking on is a long-term business model. And it will take, you know, hopefully we won't, you know, spend 50 years like Dr. Samuel Wise, <laughs> you, uh, you know, convince gynecologists to wash their hands. <laughs> okay, so, so I think uh, we human beings uh, may be getting smarter, you know, uh, uh, or adopting, adapting technology a little bit faster. So that's the, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, but we constantly bump into people and say, you know, I really don't want to know. I don't want to know my cancer risk or my Parkinson risk. You know, if I get it, I get it, you know, so, but that's, you know, that's, 
you know, that, that may, may not be our early adopter. <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah. Really, really fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so, I, I, at least I, I, I hope I have convinced you that you oh, should yeah. become human longevity's client. <laughs> okay. So, so. Definitely. Once I can get out of the, the house, uh, yeah. I'll head up. Yeah. 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 Um, and, I'm, and I'm really, as I said, I, I went offline. I'm glad to see you leading this, um, knowing your background and, and knowing your passion for this stuff and the ability to manage um, multiple ideas and businesses. Yeah. It's going to be crucial. And I take my hat off to you, as I said. Um, for, for everybody that's uh, going to be watching this episode on the Idea Me YouTube channel or listening on the various uh, podcast networks, uh, you've been listening uh, to the amazing, uh, multifunctional Dr. Wei Wu He, uh, Executive Chairman of Human Longevity Inc., uh, founder and general partner of Emerging Technology Partners, uh, doing really amazing things on the cutting edge of preventative health care, increasing quality of life, increasing health span, reducing disabilities, reducing health care costs, and ultimately uh, preventing death or keeping... <laughs> keeping the reaper away as long as possible. Um, Dr. He, it's been great seeing you again after all these years. Um, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for everything you're doing now. And as we say, thank you for moving the, the human story forward uh, for all of us. This is gonna be a, a fascinating future to watch indeed. Yeah. Ira, thank you so much. You know, it's really uh, great to reconnect with you. And, uh, you know, life sciences is a small, small community. And I think it's always good to see that uh, some of our old friends, my mentors, we're all working together, you know. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, the, the beauty of our community is that everybody is passionate about, yep. uh, you know, pushing technology to help people live longer and healthy. And I think that's really the, you know, what uh, brings us together. And it's really... Uh, you know, to me, I think it's a fascinating career. It's a, you know, uh, you know, so it's a, you know, so I'm doing it for free, I should tell you the truth. <laughs> so, I, I so, and a human longevity, you know, I think Steve Jobs took a dollar salary at Apple. I decided to take zero. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so that's the, you know, that's, uh, you know, how committed we are, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, hopefully deep technology will ultimately benefit thousands and thousands of people uh, that's really uh that's really you know uh, you know the the goal of the corporate company yeah wonderful wonderful uh, dr great seeing you thank you for your time today it, it was really a wonderful episode yeah thank you so much ira <laughs>